it's 6.32 p.m. Uh, January 19th, uh, and I would like to call the HCDC meeting to order. Uh, agenda item number two, consideration of the meeting minutes. Are there any edits or correction to the minutes? If not, may I have a motion to approve the November 17th of 2022 HCDC meeting minutes? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion passed. Agenda item number three. Uh, are there any public comments for items not on the agenda? Moving on to agenda item number four. Really quick, uh, Caleb, the, there might be a comment online. I'm gonna to try to let this person speak if that's okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Shelly Zabel from Community and Family Resources and I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to work with you. Um, I think that uh, most of you are aware that we did have a merger and Prelude um, that with Prelude, Prelude um, came under us on July 1. Um, I, we, I do want to come back and make a more formal presentation, but I did want to kind of let you know what um, some of the merger has entailed. Um, both agencies uh, provided similar services and we've been able to uh, kind of streamline management. It provided cost savings to both agencies and we're looking at the strengths from each side and trying to uh, move forward, implementing different processes that maybe Prelude uh, did a better job of than we did so we can learn from each other. Um, I just felt like there were some questions at your last meeting about our merger, um, but we actually had begun the process of providing consultation services um, clear back in September of 2020. So it was right after the pandemic began. And um, it was also at a time that uh, there, the agency director for Prelude was, was beginning to contemplate retirement. So those were some of the reasons for uh, the merger. And I do hope we can come back and do a, a more formal presentation. I have it on the agenda, so. That's it for online. Okay, uh, moving on to agenda item number four. Um, with the aid to agencies funding discussion, is there any discussion for the FY24 legacy aid to agencies draft funding recommendations from the November meeting? I, I um, just have a comment. I went back and read through everything again, um, including the staff comments and recommendations um, and now that I see see this all written out in front of me and was able to really look at it um, and some of the discussion last time when applicants are late and um, their scores are pretty low I do think that we may want to talk a little bit more about um, not funding community and family resources or not funding Center for Worker Justice. Because some of the, some, some agencies did get cut. So I don't know if anybody else has any comments about that. My, I, I'm the same as I was uh, two months ago at our last meeting. I feel that allowing late applicants to compete and to get funding is unfair, especially the application deadline was clear. I know that we have used the term technical, um, they had technical um, problems, but 
actually, I, I, I believe what happened is that they ran the clock down too far. That application, I know, is a little problematic getting it in. You have to have the time to get it in. Um, they had to, I believe what happens, this is going back a couple of years, um, but I believe what happens if you don't get it in at five o'clock, uh, you have to call and have it late accepted. And I believe that's what happened. I think that was in part of the uh, response from the agencies and it took them some time to get in a hold of the person because there were probably a number of agencies um, trying to get some assistance at the last minute. But that still doesn't change the fact that um, they were late. The other thing is that um, if they didn't, I would accept technical um, difficulties in, in getting the application and if they had had something like they lost power, their computers went down, and I would have expected them to call us, and I don't believe they called us, I think we called them. Um, so, so again, I, I do not think it's fair to any of the other applicants um, if we um, allow late applicants to be able to continue to compete for funding. That's where I am. And again, when I went back and looked at the scoring, um, which people want to get high scores, but we have um, a cluster of scores from 82 to 87. There are several, several agencies that were cut. And I think um, some were cut, some were not. And I think to be totally equitable and um, have a rationale of how we decide these things, I just think we should reconsider that. And so I would say um, to put Center for Work and Justice back to zero. Are we going in order around the table? Mm -mm. No, okay. Well, I came in on the tail end of that, but what I heard, I agree with. Um, I also have been troubled a little bit the past couple months um, with funding Center for Worker Justice. And it has nothing to do with anything other than the scoring. Um, it also has to do with the uh, late application. But I went back and read staff recommendations and there were a number of things listed that supported their decision to suggest it not be funded. And so I would ask the commission members to consider that also when making their decision is that it's not based just on one thing. Um, there are others in the application. I think one of them was asking for money for which the grant wasn't intended. Is that right? Do you guys remember? So I believe that was one of the things, um, and I believe that um, I believe that Center for Worker Justice discussed that in one of their responses as well. Um, it was in the application, but they said they wouldn't be using um, funds for things that weren't eligible or outside of Iowa City, I guess. Thank you. Sorry, you were like the first person to open up the I probably didn't. I'm sorry, I probably didn't pull mine close enough. So I wasn't here last time and I apologize for that. Um, uh, I had to go out of town for a conference, but I was wondering um, with the late application and you mentioned Maybe they didn't contact us, but we contacted them. Could you just provide like a little bit more detail? Like how late was it? And is it the case that they just didn't turn it in and someone reached out to them? Or uh, what exactly happened in that situation? I think this was explained in one of the answers. Oh, sorry. 
So these applications are accepted through United Way, not directly by the city. Um, our understanding was that two applications were late within 30 minutes of the deadline. They had technical issues and reached out to United Way, and that's the reason that they accepted it. So. Uh, I think the application is already being accepted because it is presented to us to grade it and to go over it. If it is not accepted, they shouldn't come to the floor to discuss it. And I don't think that it's that late. I think it's just technical glitch about 30 minutes or so, and I don't think that should affect uh, their status. Then I'd like you to define um, what else can uh, fall outside guidelines. I mean, if is 45 minutes too late? Is an hour too late? Is midnight too late? Does this apply to all the other applications from here on out for all the funds? That what does application for? deadline mean? Correct. They're still a legacy agency, so they'll come back every year. Right. Um, but then the other thing I was thinking when after then, after we had this discussion, we reviewed the home and CDBG application, um, and a lot of the agencies that we're dealing with tonight are probably will come in for an application for home and CDBG. And that's a hard and fast rule from the city that you have to have them in on time or they're not considered. And I just think for this process, it should be the same across for the city. I mean, what United, we can't do anything about what United Way does. But my biggest concern is cutting habitat, aging services, RBAP, and Horizons from what they, because if you take away the 15,000, we could add more to them. Which ones did you say? Iowa Valley Habitat for Humanity, Aging Services, RVAP, and Horizons. Do you want a motion? Um, well, I think that it sounds like we would like to, correct me if I'm incorrect, but I'm hearing that we would like to take away the funding from CWJ and disperse it amongst the others. Or would we like to honor the funding that we had decided in November? I, I think we have two options either we can disperse that 15,000 if we decide to take it away from um, the recommendation of CWJ. Could also go, I think we, we reached a little bit into the emerging agency fund, so we could put it back into the emerging agency fund also. So I believe in order for us to have a motion, we'll just have to uh, come to agreements uh, on which one of those options we would like. Um, myself, I would be a proponent of uh, taking the funds away from the CWJ allocation and uh, dispersing them amongst the others that Marianne had su suggested, um, possibly even utilizing our previous score rankings to uh, come up with a distribution amount. I might suggest we break that down into first have a vote on the CWJ and then another vote separately on how people want to handle the 15 grand if they want to disperse it and then if that passes then you can good go on that that's i guess how i would handle it okay would we like to vote on um taking away those funds from uh, cwj maybe let's just go um one by one uh starting with myself 
uh, personally, I would be in favor of taking that away. Um, I'm going to, well, can I just ask another question for people who are recommending that we take it away? Is it, is it the lateness only, or is it something in addition to that? To me personally, I, I think that it would be a good idea to take it away because as others have spoken, I, I don't know exactly where we draw the line of uh, acceptable uh, versus unacceptable and uh, deviance from what the application says. And so I think that it may be most equitable um, to consider that late because it was late, even if it was minuscule, and uh, disperse it to those who were uh, able to honor the rules. Can I think about it for a minute? Can you skip me? Is that okay? I guess I'm a bit apprehensive about just removing the funding that we agreed on last time, still sort of with the understanding that it was, they are new to the process. They, they did have a difficulties that we talked about before. They were not very late, exactly how late they should be. I do feel like that's somewhat sort of why we're I guess a commission here is to be able to make that judgment in a sense. Uh, if we could write down exactly rule for rule, what we're gonna do in every single case, well then we wouldn't really have a, a role for this commission, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, so I suppose I'm yeah, apprehensive about just simply removing their funding. Absolutely, I think I wouldn't give them more than I wouldn't push for giving them any more than the minimum right now, but I do believe that they provide an important service for the uh, for the community, and it would be I think it'd be good to not recommend funding them in a, not giving them any funding. But uh, yeah. well, I think everybody has uh, hopefully heard me. I um. I just go back to, again, we can't control what the United Way does as far as accepting applications, but we know the city's policy about accepting late, late applications. And I'm really concerned about applicants who scored very high and got cut. So I would say, um, you know, they. They're still a legacy agency, and they'll come back next year. So I would vote to not fund them. I do want to clarify that I believe this is a, would they be eligible for second year funding? This is a two year application. Correct, It's this um, allocation will be um, prorated next year, so it'll be the same pool of applicants. I just like informed decisions. I like people to yes. have the full knowledge base. Well, but they will come back then. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I haven't changed my mind. It's not a happy decision on my part. I, if, if some of you remember, I advocated for them to become an um, legacy agency. So I am not happy, but you know, a rule's a rule. And um, I have to say that I've not been in favor of allocating Center for Worker Justice or Community and Family Resource Center any funding because of late applications. I am in favor to fund the CWJ. I will vote no for the motion. I am in favor of not funding them at this time for all the reasons previously stated. And I think that it not only amounts to fairness to the other applicants, but also fairness to um, all the applicants to come and the other grants that we um, help um, distribute. So my answer is uh, not to fund them. Okay, so I think, I guess I, 
I think that if we were in control of the applications and they were being submitted to the city and the city had a firm deadline in terms of you know not accepting things late, then I would be for it. But if United Way accepted it and put it forward in front of us, then I think that complicates things because I can imagine situations in the future where people would be late and we would get the application, but we wouldn't even know that they were late because you know I don't know how that message or that information is conveyed. So I think I'm actually against um, taking away the funding. Staff, can you enlighten us? I believe, I, I do not like to rely on my memory, but I believe that United Way unlocked whatever they have to do to accept it, but told them that they'd have to talk to the city about the, they, that did not give them, they did not speak for the city in terms of whether or not the city would allow a late application to be processed, correct? So uh, when we when it, when we realized they their timestamps, so um, it was noticed they were late. We reached out to United Way to ask about it, and they they notified us that there were technical difficulties. And so um, on our end, we accepted them based on information from United Way. So it was United Way that said that there was technical dif difficulties, specifically not not Center for Worker Justice. Right, we, we reached out to United Way to ask about because they're the ones who are receiving the applications. I'm gonna find it, not right now, but I will. So I'm curious, because I know I read it. <clears throat> and Michael, I apologize, were you in favor of removing the funding or keeping? I, I'm going to be uh, in favor of keeping the fund. I'm going to be in favor of keeping the, the funding for now. Four to three. What does that leave us? Four to three. Four to three. Yeah, if I'm counting correctly, we have four in favor to remove the funding. Can I explain something before you guys make a decision? We have it. We have it's it. It's up to you if you're we accepting made a public comment. Yet. We're still discussing. Um, we would take a public comment, um, but we would just ask for the consideration that there be no more, more, no more than five minutes. Yeah, it's not going to be more than five minutes. Actually, we were not late. I submitted the application 10 minutes. When I first submitted, it was almost 10 minutes before the deadline. And it started like it's bending, it's bending, it's bending. Like when it come, becomes like seven minutes left, I freaked out and I called the United Way. I said, hey, what's happened? They said sometimes like when everybody submitting at the same time, this is habit. And she just said, hold on, I will fix it. And she tried like very hard to do it. And uh, I was in the phone with her and she just said, why don't you get out and get in again and do this and do that. And also she bit me in the hole. She said, oh, another person call because they have also something. And I being in that wedding, but our application was ready to be submitted. We was working all day long on that day to submit it and provide everything as it as should be. But we were not late. I explained that on my explanation when the city asked me why I'm late. And I said, contact United Way. And I, I wrote it, I noted down what time I called United Way. And I told United Way, now it's seven minutes. I still have seven minutes to submit this. Help me out. So that's why I think they told you it was definitely technical difficulty. But we were not late. And just think about it, this two year grant, we really I like work hard to to be a legacy agency, at least to get that fifteen thousand every year, at least as we just been discussed. But please like reconsider your decision because we were not late if that the main reason. Are we waiting for a motion? Um, we're currently just figuring out whether or not we would like to indeed pull that away. Um, I, I find it unfortunate to say, but I do still stick with um, my vote myself of removing it. Um, I, I think it could be unfortunate, but I, just for equality in the future, I, I would stick with my vote. And I guess I'm just asking to see if Others are sticking with their votes. Uh, if not, if anyone would like to change.
If no one would like to change, um, again, I have uh, noted four in favor to remove the funding and three in favor to keep it. Um, we now just have to uh, decide how we would like to disperse uh, the money that was allocated towards CWJ or if we would like to refill the emerging aid to agencies pot. I would like to see it go back to the emergency agency. Emerging? Yeah. Emergency. Yeah. Yes, the emerging agencies. I would like to see it go back there. I would agree. That's where I'd like to see it go. Yeah, I am in favor of uh, putting those money to, to emergency, to, to agencies, to emerging agencies. Uh, we have currently 24,300. Uh, if we put the 15,000, we will go above the 5%, and I'm OK with that. Is an agency who receives zero funding in this process eligible to um, ask for emergency emerging agency money? Can you restate your question? I missed the first part of it. it. If an agency gets zero in this process, has not recommended any funding, are they able to go to emerging agencies? I believe funding? legacy agencies would be ineligible for emerging aid to agencies. Is that an actual rule that's written someplace? Part of my problem with this whole process is I don't know where the rule book is. No, I don't think that's written somewhere. I think if you guys wanted to provide input on that, we could consider it. I don't know that we anticipated being in this position where. Right. In this position, I guess. I'm still really new to this. Can someone just tell me briefly what the emerging uh, agency budget is? not familiar. The emerging aid to agencies budget can be up to 5% of the total legacy pot and that funding goes towards agencies who are not typically not legacy agencies so newer nonprofits. Um, I think that started around FY20. In the last couple years it's been about a budget of about $30,000 for the newer agencies. And is there a deadline to apply for those funds or is it sort of a rolling thing? Or? That's actually opening now. It's open opened at the end of December and applications are due um, at the end of January. So you'll be seeing those come through next once we finish this process up. The application that we approved at the last meeting states on the front page that their late applications won't be accepted. So I think that that takes away that question of, you know, are, what if one's late again? Typically, when the emergency emerging agencies apply, are there um, is there money left over, or is there more more ask than we have? What do you think? Um, typically, I think we have more applications than we have funding, okay. but it just varies by year and how much yeah. agencies request. We never really know what to expect. And that's a two-year cycle, also. No, nope, that's every every, every year, year. that one. Okay. Are there any opposed to replenishing the emerging aid agency spot with those funds? That would be my preference. Currently, I've counted four uh, in favor of replenishing that. So now seeking a motion. May I have a motion to recommend the FY24 legacy aid to agencies budget allocations to city council with the previous November recommendations with the adjustment of the 15,000 that was previously awarded to Center for Workers Justice uh, to be allocated back to the emerge to agencies pot. So moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Motion carried. Hey Caleb, can I ask a question? So does the commission have thoughts on allowing the 
if like you see agencies that were not funded to apply for emerging? I do, <laughs> and I would like to propose that we allow um, any agency that uh, did not receive money that they are eligible to apply in the emerging in the emerging emerging agencies funding round. I agree. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, just to say it out loud, the applications for those are due on Monday, January 30th at noon, um, and those are online. So now moving on to agenda item number five, uh, we have a discussion of the creation of a subcommittee to review the aid to agencies process. Um, so essentially in this agenda item, we need to uh, decide, A, if that's something that we would have a consensus on willingness to do, uh, and B, we would need to uh, allocate uh, commissioners. We would just need a couple of them, two or three, to uh, serve on that, as well as to decide how our reporting would be handled. Uh, for example, how often they would meet and how often we'd request reports. We're fighting over who gets to go first. I want my own microphone. <laughs> They're never going to give you your own microphone. <laughs> um, I think this is a great idea. This is my first time to go through this process with uh, emerging and legacy agencies. And um, there is a lot of confusion. And I think the letter was great. And I appreciate everybody who submitted it. And I think it's a great idea. I do have one suggestion for the makeup of the committee. Because these applications, the legacy agency applications, go through the United Way, I think it behooves us to ask the United Way to have a representative at these meetings. Because we've talked a lot about how the application needs to change, that we're not getting the information that we need to make good decisions. And so if, if it's and there's a lot of people, a lot of agencies that fill out the United Way application that are also filling out for legacy agency money. So it just makes sense to get them on board also. I have I a question. I nominate Becky. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is it necessary um, for the United Way and this commission to be joined on the application? Or is it possible to, to sever that? And I mean, what's the reason? Well, I have some, I have some thought about um, that because I don't remember what meeting it was. This, I, these meetings run together. I remember things we talk about, but we went through the application, I think early, one of the earliest meetings for this year. And I specifically sighed are our recommendations going to make changes? Because honestly, I don't want to waste my time with something that should have been changed back in 2010 on United Way's part. And I believe, you know, staff made the effort, they gave the changes, but there were too many and United Way said, if you want that many changes, uh, maybe you should do your own application. And um, so I'm in favor of splitting the process from United Way. United Way is going through a lot of changes, I believe, because they have a new CEO. I don't know if that's gonna slow things down. I don't want any sacred cows to come in. We're doing it this way because we've done it like this for 15 years. I really wanted to get into a new pro. It's not just the application, but it's, if you read through, um, and thank you to Agency Impact Coalition for providing us with the correspondence. If you read through that correspondence, this the need to um, redrive this funding process um, came back before the pandemic. Um, it is uh, was a result of some big changes made in the amount of funding that was allocated to the aid to agencies process is what we used to call it. And, um, and I thought those recommendations um, from the Agency Impact Coalition were spot on in terms of, uh, again, it's my memory, it's not all that great anymore, but 
in terms of uh, having site visits, I, I think it would be beneficial for us all to, and, and how we did that um, would be good, to, but to talk about how, how that could happen, to make sure that there's a flow of information of the successes. I mean, we're allocating $700,000 um, to meet uh, community needs, meant much of it, emergency um, types of services, to communicate back to council and to become advocates for additional money for the agencies. Um, I don't think that's part of the circle that I don't think is connected. So, so um, I'm really in favor of doing this on our own um, as a subcommittee of the um, HCDC. If we want, once we're down the line and we start talking about the application, if we want to include United Way in those discussions, I'm open to it then. But I think starting with our own meeting subcommittee um, with staff um, members, a couple of representatives from AIC, whoever they would choose, and then I don't want to limit it. You know, I mean, I don't know who wants to serve on this, but if people are willing to serve on the subcommittee, I think they should be allowed to. It's just additional work and additional meetings. So, so that's where I stand, bringing in United Way a little bit later down the line. I am in favor of creating this uh, subcommittee, but I would like to know more about the purpose and the scope of uh, the subcommittees. Uh, in the letter they said, they, they see they, they would like to see an evaluation of the application and how much they can change on on the current application. Um, myself, I would be in favor of the creation of the subcommittee. I would as well. Me too. I would be in favor. Um, so now that we're all in favor, happy. <laughs> in favor of the creation of the sub subcommittee, um, I believe that we just now have to uh, decide on parameters, uh, such as the um, how often we would like them to report. Are they reporting every time they have a recommendation, or is it a report every uh, meeting? Before we move on, could we get a formal vote just to form the subcommittee? I may have a motion to uh, approve the formation of a subcommittee. I motion. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. And then, um, so along with those parameters, I think that we should also specify uh, exactly who is uh, volunteering for that subcommittee. Again, to my knowledge, we uh, cannot have a full quorum, uh, but we need to have uh, at least a couple of people on it. Is there anyone that would volunteer to serve on that subcommittee? I'd like to be on it. I also would. Are we limited in two members, or what, are, what would the rules be? It would just have to be a published meeting? I think it would just need to be less than a quorum. Less than a quorum, so we could have What's our quorum? Five? Five. Can I ask how often a, a, a subcommittee would meet? What would be the, uh, I guess, the commitment on that? I think it's really up to the group. I, I think that depends on how much. Uh, my hope would be is in 30 to 60 days, we could come up with a calendar um, guideline of of, of goals and, and a calendar of a time or a timeline of activities, so. I, I would like to uh, volunteer, volunteer to participate. Then would we like to uh, establish parameters around when uh, they would meet or when they would update? Or would we like to uh, simply just form the subcommittee and then uh, figure that out at a later time. Well, I, don't, uh, I always like t deadlines. <laughs> I drive through deadlines. So why don't we um, ask for a, um, 
for a report on on what you suggested um, time frames uh, timeline and uh, by the March meeting so it gives us 60 days to get it together get a meeting and do all of that do we need a motion for the members I don't think so okay So moving on to agenda item I number. I just ask a question real quick. I'm sorry. Yes. How, um, how are we going to um, visit with the other um, organizations in terms of their membership on the subcommittee? How does that work? I, I, I don't have the answer, um, but I, I think that that's something that has the it's if it's a new enterprise as it's created mm -hmm. uh, should possibly be established and as Becky was talking about maybe be introduced um, with some sort of deadline before the March meeting should we vote to ask two members or AIC to appoint two members to attend it's up to you pardon it's up to you it also Wait. um Becky, I'd also, or everyone, um, I'd also ask you to consider um, that not all of the legacy agencies that apply to this program are on the AIC, so how you want to consider um, other agencies and their involvement. If you want to invite everyone and um, have people appoint representation, that would be one option, but just to consider that not every single legacy is, on the, is within that group. How many are not? Uh, I don't know. Offhand. It's open to everybody. I know that. Um, I, never find the I think I there would have to be minutes, and I would think at least all of the legacy agencies would receive all course all the minutes, at least. Because um, otherwise, that's going to be a pretty big committee if everybody could be involved, which is going to take more than 60 days, because you're going to have, you know, a lot of people. Would we disseminate information to everybody, everybody before we actually come to um, a suggestion or a recommendation, uh, or do we wait? Yeah, do we wait until we have this and then present it? Well, I think if we keep them informed with the process, yes, and send them the minutes, send them, you know, whatever the committee does, the timeline and objectives and strategies that kind of thing and the minutes i think that they at least if they're informed then yeah they could come to the it, i don't know if there's going to be like some kind of joint meeting between all of us and the subcommittee we don't know any of that but mm -hmm. i think they all should be at least informed as much as possible yeah It looks like the ones who are not um, on that um, agency impact coalition are aging, I think, I just took a quick look, but aging services, houses into homes, Dream City, the community and family resources, and then Center for Worker Justice. Community family resource, community family resources used to be Prelude. Prelude was a member of AIC. Is, are they not listed? No. Okay. So what would you suggest with the, uh, I mean, it was easy when I thought we could just have AIC recommend a couple of representatives. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, um, AIC, if they could reach out to those agencies that are not part of the process, maybe exp try again to expand their membership. I mean, that would be the easiest to tell you the truth is for all the agencies to join AIC and then um, let us work with, with two representatives from AIC. Otherwise, we'd have potentially seven agencies, I think, on our right. And if that were the case, I don't know. Um, so. Uh, 
ask, uh, I, I saw Adam, uh, a couple of people from AIC here. Can I ask if they've reached out to the um, agencies not in AIC? To the chair. Is it okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Can I, uh, can I ask uh, uh, Adam from RVAP, who I think he's here, is he not? There he is. <laughs> I thought I saw you when he came in. May I ask, may I talk to him? and get some information, thanks. Yes. So Adam, do you know about uh, invitations to the, I think uh, Jennifer listed five? We'd be happy to reach out and include them, absolutely. Okay. Would that be sufficient for everybody then if, they, if AIC reached out to them, invited them to attend their meetings because I believe they have started to meet again. Am I correct, Adam? Correct. Yep. Yep. So, um, and would that suffice everybody then that they've been invited to join that and have a say in who AIC will appoint as a couple of representatives? I would say two to three people. I'd say up to four. Because then you'd have seven, you right? Saying? Four. Ask them to provide four representatives. Okay. And then we'd have staff involved too, correct? Yes. Okay. One thing to note also, uh, this subcommittee might need uh, a chairman or chairperson to, to organize the meeting and to lead the efforts. I'm sorry, to organize a meeting? <clears throat> yes, uh, I said this subcommittee might need chairperson to organize the meetings and to keep us updated with, with, the, with the new information. Would anyone like to volunteer to be the chair? <laughs> it's my baby. <laughs> I want it, I've been wanting to see it. I, I would love to lead the charge on it. Yeah. Okay, then are we ready to move on? Do we need any kind of motion for this? I don't know that that's a formal role or not. It's, okay. I don't think I need anything. If you want to vote on it, I think that's fine. No, I'm fine. Okay, moving on to agenda item number six, uh, proposed changes to the audit policy. So in about 2018, um, the city council asked, um, that was right about when we were um, updating our aid to agency process with the new emerging agencies. Um, city council asked staff to come up with an audit policy um, for, I guess, accountability with um, the agencies that we would be funding with public funds. Um, and we, our current audit policy is based on the agency's total annual budget. So if they are less than 100,000, we require a year-end financial statement signed by the director and board president up to um, from 100,000 to 499,999. We require a review by a certified public accountant annually. And then if the budget is over 500,000, we would require an actual audit. Um, and we've been reviewing this um, requirement because um, we're finding that um, with COVID funding, some of the smaller agencies are having a larger budget and that's triggering the audit requirement. And um, there are some instances where maybe the city's only funding about $15,000 for their project or uh, for the, yeah, for aid agencies. Um, and audits, we're told audits can cost up to $10,000. And so we're feeling that this policy is gonna be burdensome on agencies or potentially. Um, so we're, staff is proposing to revise the policy um, and instead of the um, different levels of um, budget, we are for all agencies, it will be the same. Um, we're gonna require, um, let's see, um, copies of their tech, their 990 tax forms, and then a year end profit and loss statement approved by the board. And we know that a lot of agencies already do audits. We can, we'll be able to review those, um, but just to be fair to all agencies and not, um, 
cause a financial burden that is, in my opinion, unnecessary. Um, we we're proposing to council that we would revise this. So we're open to, we're not really looking for approval from HDDC, but if you have any comments on that, um, we'd be open to hearing it. Well, I, I agree. I think it can be financially burdensome. Um, so I agree with that. Uh, what concerns me, I guess, is um, the plethora of uh, differences that we got in the application process. And I'm a little concerned about that because one sticks in my mind where we asked, okay, is your, is your, are your financials correct? And, and I think the board got involved and said, no, and here's the correction. However, this really isn't correct either because we've got some money in a CD or something like that. And that bothered me a lot. <laughs> I, just, I felt like we went back, asked the question. So I'm a little concerned about um, some of the smaller organizations and just their ability to you know, provide. I mean, we got P&Ls, but it didn't really tell us anything. So I don't know if there's any way that there can be some sort of fillable form you know, that kind of guides some of the smaller agencies. You guys might talk about that. Um, I just think some of the smaller agencies might need a little bit of help and how do they do this and how do they f um, figure it out? And these are the very, there's only a couple of really small agencies, but but that is a concern of, of mine. I, I felt like the financials were just all over the place. So, otherwise, I, I'd be in favor of the changes. Um, although I do think audits are good. Well, I know in my experience, audits are very, expen very expensive. Um, and um, keep in mind, though, if the revenue of a nonprofit is less than $50,000 in one year, the, there's no 990. It's a postcard that you send into the IRS. So it's good that you're getting P&Ls, but what about balance sheets? We could, we could require that as well, um, if you'd suggest that. I think so. And we, you know, we have to keep in mind that it's, it's up to the board, the boards of the nonprofits, because they're the ones that have the fiscal responsibility. And so, you know, if, if the nonprofit doesn't have a board, the board capability to oversee their fiscal activities, then that would be a concern for us to even give them any money, in my opinion. But. Well, 501Cs are required to have a board of directors, aren't they? Oh, yeah. 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 That doesn't mean that they see the financials, though. I think, think that's... So uh, I, I would, again, say um, I'm wondering if there would be the creation of a simple, um, fillable type thing. But I, I, did, I, I like the board approved. That was one of my recommendations during the process is that we require a financial statement, a year-end financial statement that's been approved by the board. <laughs> But I would ask them to include a copy of their minutes um, that shows that the um, financial statement was reviewed and approved by the board. That sounds good. Um, I think part of it is the application, which we're going to discuss with the subcommittee. And this is kind of in addition to that. So I think there's, there's room that we can figure out what we need. And quite honestly, I do think uh, really taking a look and deep dive into that application and the um, financials, we're going to clear some, going to be able to clear up some of the things for the next round of applications. But I think what you're proposing overall is good. And I think it's thoughtful, especially for agencies that do have small budgets. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I like it. All right, up next, agenda item number seven, staff and commission updates. I have just a couple updates. We already kind of touched on it, but so at the end of January, the CDBG and home applications will be due, and those projects will be affordable housing and public facility projects. Um, and then you'll also see the emerging aid to agencies applications coming through, and that's, again, the smaller nonprofit agencies. So when we receive those, we'll be sending those to you for your review, and then we'll also, like we normally do, do the staff review sheets where we're summarizing 
things we want you to know or to help you with your calculations on the scoring. So kind of winding down the legacy aid to agency stuff and then starting a, another process right away. So between this meeting and the next meeting, you'll be seeing the um, submissions for those applications. The other thing I wanted to mention was there's probably going to be a slight adjustment to the timeline that was in your packet. The March meeting was going to be on the fourth Thursday of the month due to spring break, and there's a conflict with this meeting space, and there's five Thursdays in March, so we are going to propose March 30th, I believe. That's the fifth Thursday of the month. Does anyone have a known conflict? No. So just a heads up on that. She's got a busy schedule. I'm fine on the 30th so far. So far, we'll pencil us in, please. <laughs> Otherwise, I think that's all, all my updates. The agenda item number eight, adjournment. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. I always do all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope.